This is a video that I have known for a while I'd probably have to make, and it seems like the time is now. For whatever reason, over the last couple of months, I have seen a huge increase in people carrying on about the fact that Islam is apparently right about women. Whilst I know that some people are simply using this phrase as a way to troll feminists and will no doubt defensively cry, it's just a meme, it does, however, appear that a rather large contingent of this community genuinely do seem to believe that Islam is a viable boilerplate social template to keep hypergamous female nature under control. Well, I think this actually needs to be examined. And sure, there are others in this community, like I Am Serious, who are probably far more qualified than I to speak on the issue of Islam, but even uncultured, untraveled Western dummies like myself can uncover a wealth of information on the topic if only one can be bothered to look at the actual facts rather than just lazily regurgitating internet catchphrases. Okay, to start with, let's talk about divorce, the proverbial dissolution of the family unit, lamented by traditionalists everywhere, and one of, or perhaps the principal rationalization behind the growing claim that Islam is right about women. Well, this may surprise you to hear, but in the Islamic world, the divorce rate is not quite as low as you might think. Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country in the world. According to Statista, Indonesia saw 408,000 Muslim couples divorce in 2018. With a Muslim population of 225 million, that places the crude divorce rate of the Indonesian Muslim community at 1.8. That is almost two-thirds of the way to the 2.9 crude divorce rate that we see in the United States of feminism. Statista also tells us that there was just over 2 million Muslim marriages that same year. That means a divorce rate of 20%. Is that better than the US? Sure. But at 1 in 5, it is still worse than your odds of playing Russian roulette. Those are the kinds of numbers we are talking about here, people. A fifth of all Muslim marriages in the most populous Muslim country on earth end in divorce. This article from Melbourne University, which laments the sexist struggles faced by divorce-prone Indonesian women, ultimately goes on to state that, quote, Divorce cases form the single largest group of contested cases in the Indonesian judicial system. In fact, in 2010, divorce cases represented 80% of all civil cases heard in Indonesia. Data from the Indonesian Religious Islamic Courts, which have exclusive jurisdiction over Muslim marriage and divorce, shows that there has been a significant increase in the number of state-sanctioned divorces over the past decade, while 251,208 cases of divorce were decided by the religious courts nationally in 2010, the number increased by half again to reach 382,231 cases in 2014. About 80% of the divorce applications were made by women and were granted by the courts." End quote. So that's an interesting insight into the state of Islam in Southeast Asia, but what about the Islamic homeland? How do things fare back in the direction of Mecca? Going through this list of Arab countries ranked by divorce rates, we see that quite a few of these countries have crude divorce rates much, much higher than you might have first expected. Saudi Arabia, crude divorce rate of 1.1. Algeria, crude divorce rate of 1.5. Lebanon, 1.6. Egypt, 1.9, Kuwait, 2.2, Jordan, crude divorce rate of 2.6. That, that is 90% of the United States crude divorce rate. And keep in mind that these are countries in the Arab world, where Muslims don't just make up the majority population, but also control state politics. Things are not looking good, not in Islamic Asia, not in the Islamic Middle East, which begs the question, how does the sanctity of Islamic marriage fare outside of the Muslim world? The second largest Muslim population and the largest Muslim minority population in the world belongs to India, accounting for 11% of the world's total Muslim population. And according to this article on Live Mint, the divorce rate of Muslim women in India is twice the national average. Things don't look any better for American Muslims either. 
This article discussing the statistics, challenges, and supposed solutions to the problem of divorce amongst American Muslims states that, in terms of divorce within the North American Muslim community, the last study conducted about this was in the early 90s by the late New York-based sociologist Ilias Bianis. According to his research, the continental Muslim divorce rate stood at 31.14%. Today, that rate seems to be increasing. So why? Why are these Muslim couples divorcing? Well, unsurprisingly, the main reasons cited for Muslim divorce are largely the same reasons cited for Western divorce. Adultery, incompatibility, abuse, and of course, the money. We have long since known the link between money and divorce, so it is absolutely baffling to me how many morons parroting this catchphrase that Islam is right about women don't seem to know the first fucking thing about how finances function within Muslim relationships. This article from Islam Web outlining the financial rights of women is fairly illuminating, and I think it deserves to be read in full. Quote, In Islam... Greater financial security is assured for women. Women in Islam have been given more financial security as compared to the men. They are entitled to receive marital gifts, to keep present and future properties, and income for their own security. No married woman is required to spend a penny from her property and income on the household. She is entitled to full financial support during marriage and during her idha, waiting period after divorce. In case of divorce, and if she has children, she is also entitled to child support. No financial responsibility. A woman in Islam does not shoulder any financial obligations. It is the man who shoulders this responsibility in the family. It is the duty of the father or the brother before she is married to look after her lodging, boarding, clothing and financial aspects, and it becomes the duty of her husband or her son after she is married. If a woman works, which she is not forced to, all earnings she makes are absolutely her property. She is not obligated to spend from it on the household unless she wants to do so of her own free will. Irrespective of how rich the wife is, the duty to give lodging, boarding, clothing, and look after the financial aspects of the wife remains that of the husband. Her property as a wife. Since its advent, Islam has granted married women the independent personality. In Islam, the bride and her family are under no obligation whatsoever to present a gift to the groom. It is the groom who must present the bride with a marriage gift. This gift is considered her property, and neither the groom nor the bride's family have any share or control over it. The bride retains her marital gifts even if she is later divorced. The husband is not allowed any share in his wife's property except what she offers him with her free consent. The Quran has stated the Islamic position on this issue quite clearly in the verse which means, And give the women upon marriage their bridal gifts graciously. But if they give up willingly to you anything of it, then take it in satisfaction and ease. The wife's property and earnings are under her full control and for her use alone, since her and her children's maintenance is her husband's responsibility. No matter how rich the wife might be, she is not obliged to act as a co-provider for the family unless she herself voluntarily chooses to do so. Spouses do inherit from one another. Moreover, a married woman in Islam retains her independent legal personality and her family name. Inheritance Centuries ago, Islam gave the right of inheritance to women. If one reads the Quran, in several verses in chapters like Quran 4, Quran 2, and Quran 5, it is mentioned that a woman has the right to inherit regardless of her status, whether she is a wife, a mother, a sister, or a daughter. Generally, a Muslim woman is guaranteed support in all stages of her life, as a daughter, wife, mother, or sister. These additional advantages of women over men are somewhat balanced by the provisions of the inheritance, which allow the male, in most cases, 
to inherit twice as much as the female. This means that the male inherits more, but is responsible financially for other females, daughters, wives, mothers, sisters, while the female, i.e. a wife, inherits less, but keeps it all for investment and financial security without any obligation to spend any part of it even for her own sustenance, food, clothing, housing, medication, etc. One of the most important differences between the Quran and other faiths is the attitude towards female inheritance of the property of a deceased relative. Islam abolished all unjust customs and gave all the female relatives inheritance shares unlike other faiths. In the Quran, Allah says what means, From what is left by parents and those nearest related, there is a share for men and a share for women, whether the property be small or large, a determinate share. Muslim mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters had received inheritance rights 1,300 years before Europe recognized that these rights even existed. The division of inheritance is a vast subject with an enormous amount of details in different verses of the Quran, such as Quran 4, 7, 11, 12, 176. Rational Justification of Shares the general rule is that the female share is half the male's, except the cases in which the mother receives equal share to that of the father. This general rule, if taken in isolation from other legislations concerning men and women, may seem unfair. In order to understand the rationale behind this rule, one must take into account the fact that the financial obligations of men in Islam far exceed those of women, as we stated earlier. A bridegroom must provide his bride with a marriage gift, which becomes her exclusive property and remains so even if she is later divorced. The bride is under no obligation to present any gifts to her groom. Moreover, the Muslim husband is charged with the maintenance of his wife and children. The wife, on the other hand, is not obligated to help him in this regard. Her property and earnings are for her use alone except what she may voluntarily offer her husband. Besides, one has to realize that Islam fervently advocates family life. It strongly encourages youth to get married, discourages divorce, and does not regard celibacy as a virtue. Therefore, in a truly Islamic society, family life is the norm and single life is the rare exception. That is, Almost all marriage-aged women and men are married in an Islamic society. In light of these facts, one would appreciate that Muslim men, in general, have a greater financial burden than Muslim women, and thus, inheritance rules are meant to offset this imbalance so that the society lives free of all gender or class wars. After a simple comparison between the financial rights and duties of Muslim women, one can safely state that Islam has treated women not only fairly, but generously. Compulsory marital gift for a woman. When a woman gets married, she is on the receiving end. She receives a gift. She receives a marital gift which in Arabic is called maher. This is mentioned in the Quran in the verse which says what means, and give women on marriage their dower as a free gift. But if they of their own good pleasure remit any part of it to you, take it and enjoy it with right good cheer. For a marriage to solemnize in Islam, maher is compulsory. However, in Islam there is no lower limit, nor is there an upper limit for maher. But Islam encourages lower maher because an inflated maher would burden the couple and not only the husband, and make them start their lives with a negative balance, or at least financially exhausted. There are various cultures which have crept into the Muslim societies, which reversed the issue and made the financial obligations of the marriage lie on the shoulders of the wife-to-be and her family. Demanding dowry from the wife, directly or indirectly, is prohibited in Islam. Nonetheless, if the parents of the girl wish to give her something out of their own free will, then this is acceptable. But demanding or forcing directly or indirectly is prohibited in Islam. End quote. I know that was a rather long list of give me dats, but I think it was necessary to read in full to truly gain a concrete understanding of the financial realities surrounding Muslim marriage. Now, that last part about maher, the Islamic dowry or bride price, is extremely important for understanding further dynamics of Islamic marriage and subsequently Islamic divorce. 
The article claims that Islam encourages lower mahair, but that doesn't appear to be the reality. As we know full well, there are really no upper limits on the gibbs me dats of women. If you give women an inch, they will take a mile. Muslim women are, of course, no exception. Take, for instance, this article titled Af 